Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another issue of the Grey Market Talk, which turns out to be a Grey Market monologue. Uh, my friend Nick has the common cold. It shows that even if you're a veritable investment god, the common cold can still get you. He can't speak, so I hope I'll have him back online next week again. In the meantime, let's make this a short, brief version. I have a couple of slides I want to share with you and share some ideas, and let's get right into it. So... I started already last week uh, with my little disclaimer, obviously this is not investment advice, but also that we have something like uh, Article 5 of the Grundgesetz, the German Constitution, which is the freedom of speech. And everybody is quoting always Article 1. Jeder hat das Recht, seine Meinung in Wort, Schrift und Bild frei zu äußern und zu verbreiten. Everybody has the right to distribute his opinion in, uh, in writing, by word, by speech and in pictures. Then there's Article 2, which says, and that's usually not quoted, these rights are limited by the provisions of the general law, the statutory provisions for the protection of young people and the right to personal honor. And it's getting quite interesting because what's happening at the moment in Germany is, uh, I get into that in a second, legal proceedings to come up with, uh, yeah, Germany is a bit in a danger zone, um, to come up with something which would curtail these rights in a quite unfavorable way. Why do I have this slide here? Germany is in a danger zone. Um, consumer confidence is an absolute catastrophe. And uh, if you look out of the window or live in Germany and see what's going on, um, then you are quite concerned about the news we have on the screen. And I've prepared this earlier. Let's see where I have the articles. Yes, this is just a screener from today about Entlassung in Deutschland, layoffs in Germany. It starts with the whole uh, general uh, uh, workforce uh, is under threat. Then the automotive industry, uh, 2024 will be a horrible year. Bayer, our big pharmaceutical company, is uh, axing people in Germany. Deutsche Bank is also axing people. Uh, they wrapped it up nicely because it's a lefty newspaper said, ooh, they want to increase dividends. That's why they lay off staff. No, that's never the reason. But hey, how would you explain it to a communist? Uh, then the Spiegel, another, um, well, lefty magazine, um, said Deutsche Industrie denkt verstärkt über Lassung nach. So German industrials want planning more layoffs. Cisco is planning layoffs, uh, massive layoffs uh, in Germany by experts. Then uh, the E4, the, the, um, the confidence parameter for the industry uh, is pointing to more redundancies in Germany in 2024. And then we have, uh, well, even Riot Games, a uh, computer company, yeah, um, is planning layoffs. So what you can see in Germany, it is quite appalling what is happening here, especially when they are trying to sell to us that the open borders policy we have is because we don't have enough employ uh, employees in Germany, qualified employees. Well, you ask yourself... Uh, with all these people getting made redundant, I'm sure um, there are a lot of qualified people who used to work in good industries available for the market. So you see already here there's a lot of criticism coming in. And then you see the German economic forecasts, which are absolutely abysmal. And I think if the numbers wouldn't be, well, I don't want to call it manipulated, tinkered or well interpreted in Germany, we are already now, I think, third or fourth quarter in a recession, even though the numbers do not reflect that. And our politicians uh, are facing a lot of criticism. So if you face a lot of criticism, what can you do? You change your ways, you, argue, uh, you discuss it, you listen to people or... If you're in Germany and you're German and you read your history books, you make new laws which make it illegal to criticize the government. And they are now introducing a new law into Parliament which is translated in the Democracy Promotion Act. Uh, das uh, Demokratiefördergesetz in Germany. And there are 13, 13 little points. This is a page of, uh, from the Bundestag, from our German Parliament, from the website, where they go into the details. It involves everything, giving more power to authorities to spy on on you, giving more powers for, well, the private sector, if so instructed, to debank you, giving more powers to the authorities again. If you do something, if you say something which is under the current law not illegal, you might still be registered for that and you come on a register for it and... Uh, they don't like that. Why are they doing this? Obviously, the whole reason is if you face all this criticism and you see there is this uh, party in Germany, the Alternative for Deutschland, AfD, they are being painted as fascist, 
right extreme everything may that as it be but at the moment it seems there are the only real opposition who is heavily criticizing the government even the official opposition that CDU the Chris Democrats who are not running the government at the time are not really fitting their role of criticizing criticizing the government about especially their failed industrial policies with the highest energy prices in the world we have in Germany with almost the highest tax rates we have in Germany. And I've already shown you the screenshots of the layoffs being planned. So a former industrialized uh, or still industrialized nation is running into danger that the Morgenthau plan, if you read your history books, you know what that is. After the Second World War, Senator Morgenthau had the plan to make Germany an agricultural country. Even that's wouldn't work nowadays because they're going after the farmers now. If you're a farmer in Germany, you have to produce under very, very strict rules. That makes your product very expensive. At the same time, we are importing food products from countries which have not these regulations. Though the German farmers are on the street for the first time uh, in ages, actually, if they've ever done it. They're not like the Frenchies. They were on the streets and uh, blocked roads and access roads, and the politicians are... Well, wherever they show up, especially from the Green Party, there are big, uh, well, how would you call it, demonstrations against him. People are uh, booing them out, want them to leave, and obviously nobody in power likes this. So being a good old German, what are they going to do? They make a lot of the criticism illegal and wrap it up in a Democracy Promotion Act, uh, which will tell, yes, yes, we are in danger to be taken over by the right, which is, uh, in my view, complete madness. Uh, I grew up when the DDR, the German Democratic Republic, the communist puppet state, uh, was still in place. And I have a lot of friends uh, who grew up in the GDR who are my age. Uh, are pointing out to me, you know, this complete command and control that the government will tell how the economy is run, the government will tell what you can criticize or not. We've seen that all before, and now you're slipping back into it. We never believed that could happen that fast. However, may it as it be, that is what they are doing now. Uh, It's going through the parliament, and as we don't have a functioning opposition, I'm fairly certain it will go through. And then the next question is, what will follow after that? Being a German myself, don't trust us. Yeah, If we start this BS, don't trust us. It never leads to anything good. The moment you're not allowed to have your opinion there anymore and criticize the government, and that's what it's all about, you're not allowed to criticize the government for obvious mistakes they are making right now, then you are ending up in a situation you don't want to end up with. The freedom will be gone and... Uh, We will have to live in it, and it doesn't change over the next one or two generations. So uh, be aware of what's happening. Fine. I want to well close this quote with one of my fam- uh, favorite economists, Thomas Sowell of the Chicago School. And as it is all about redistribution, what's happening in Germany, yeah? uh, you might call it what you wanted as uh, the energy uh, uh, transition and uh, redistribution and a fair society. It is about redistribution of wealth. And in Germany, unfortunately, what we're seeing at the moment, there's no redistribution from the top to the bottom. It's going the other way around. They're destroying the middle class here because everything gets so expensive, also through food inflation, energy inflation, bureaucracy there, that the small man on the street will ask for handouts from the state and then is beholden to the state. And uh, Thomas Sowell summed that up fantastically how to always uh, you have to win every argument with a lefty who says oh the where's the fair share and the strong shoulders have to shoulder more what exactly is your fair share of what someone else has worked for just think about it for a moment use it the next time somebody tells you you have to pay their fair share but yeah what is your fair share of what i work 12 15 16 hours a day for on a saturday or sunday you tell me So, let's go into the markets. Two big points, energy markets. Uh, You have probably seen this file in your inbox this week as well. It was one of the most famous ones, energy, the crocodile jaws. And what we're seeing here is the energy sector not performing really well and the information technology best performance ever. So we have this crocodile jaw and you could say, well, that should close eventually because if you have an economy 
which is progressing, growing with official growth rates of 3%, like the United States are reporting. This is based on energy. Yes, of course, it's based on information technology, but information technology also requires energy. If the economy is growing, yeah, stuff gets transported from A to B. That requires energy. Uh, things get produced. Production facilities require energy. That's why these companies are leaving Germany at the moment, because energy is so expensive. And to produce stuff, you need energy. By the way, Porsche is also... Uh, not setting up their new uh, battery factory in Germany. They're thinking about the United States. The natural defense was, oh, yeah, they get more subsidized in the U.S. Obviously, that's all. I can't believe it anymore, what I'm hearing. Yeah? Um, they are seeing, okay, fine, it's a reliable country. They have energy resources. They're going to use it, and they can't squeeze uh, 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 their population like what's happening at the, in Germany at the moment. So Porsche is considering building their huge battery factory in the United States, not in Germany. So if everything is so fantastic, right, why does energy perform in the way we see right here at the moment? I can understand information technology was a big shift. Yeah? I'm so old. I started living in a time before the Internet. And when the Internet was introduced in 2000, people knew what was going on. It was fantastic. Uh, it made us so efficient. Where we used to have four or five mathematicians in some back room crunching numbers, I can do that now on Excel on my, uh, on my own in five minutes. So, yes, it was a huge transformation we saw. And information technology is one of the most important points. However, what's the energy sector doing? So, fine. Uh, if you want to go in now and say, fine, well, they, these jaws have to close, right? Um, if we are in a soft landing scenario like, uh, well, everybody's predicting, then energy should go up. You should be invested like crazy. Huh? And if you compare to, I just said, 2000 and today, that's the spread between energy and uh, uh, IT and communication services. So we are right there. Uh, uh, chart by the Financial Times, by the way, um, where we have been in 2000. And uh, the, well, the simple assumption would be fine. In a marketplace, we have seen here now, yeah, I had this slide on last week, since the rate hiking cycle started, the uh, US market is up by uh, 15% higher than, uh, no, 1.5%, sorry, 1.5% higher uh, then it was, uh, no, it's 15 here. I saw that it's absolutely, yes, it's 15% higher, not 1.5. There is a wrong dot in here. Anyway, it did sound implausible, so I corrected it. 15% higher than when the rate height, uh, hike cycle started. And we are sitting here and thinking, okay, what's happening? Do we have a soft landing here? And if we have a soft landing, economy is doing well. We see GDP, but GDP or a growing economy needs energy. So... What would that lead us to? If we have the soft landing, again, a chart from last week, uh, as most of the pundits at the moment are assuming, or the data even predicts, we are in a soft landing scenario in the United States, um, why is energy not performing? Well, I would assume we could look at the U.S. 2 versus 10, or 10 versus 2 years uh, interest rates. Uh, what we can see here is you have seen that before, every time before we... Uh, go into a real recession, we see a steepening of the yield curve. Yeah, we're getting steeper here again. And we have now started this steepening since 23 again. It's a longer term. What does that mean? The market, the bond market, where the clever boys are, three times as big as the equity market. Yes, they are predicting that the Fed will eventually take interest rates down at the short end massively. Yeah, uh, They have now the ammunition to do that. And when they come into recession, usually they keep on hiking till we have already the recession. And then they come down again. So if that happens, the yield curve will naturally go steeper and this steepening of the yield curve is usually a harbinger of uh, of doom let's put it that way however we are now inverted for quite a while if you can see on the chart uh, 16 17 months in and nothing has happened yet yeah um, people like myself were too bearish for a long time because we believed in the ancient ancient, I'm telling, in the models uh, uh, we were brought up with, which used to work. One of the points I didn't consider it, the lag effect. You've heard the lag effect. It takes quite a long time, as we have seen this unprecedented money printing and money being swashed, squashed into the system, uh, which we've never seen before. Of course, it takes longer till all this money is consumed. Eventually, 
they will run out of this money. And when this happens, we will see layoffs. We discussed that here before, um, that the employment data, the official employment data looks fantastic in the United States. Yeah, all hunky-dory. The world is fantastic. Nothing happens. And if you go down into the uh, state figures, they all look very, let's put it, questionable. Yeah, Somebody like uh, Jeffrey Gundlach questioned it openly and said, well, how can, how can that be that uh, unemployment is not a topic, but in 80% of the states in the United States, we see uh, uh, job losses or uh, no positive, positive development in the employment market. So keep that all in mind when we are going to the... Uh, yeah, here I've got the energy sector ETF in there. So if we say, fine, we have a soft landing and the economy is doing well and the alligator jaws between information technology and the energy sector have widened to an unbelievable level, what should you do in a scenario like this? Well, in a scenario like this, then obviously you would have to say there is a huge uh, uh, opportunity for a catch-up in the energy, energy sector. And what we can see here right now, uh, we are at the, uh, at the tops of 2014 around that, and the market is not quite sure which direction to go. However, alligator jaws can go in both directions. Yeah? The energy sector can remain subdued, like in this chart, performance-wise. And if the alligator jaws have to close eventually, what could that mean? Information technology has to come down. And one of the biggest numbers next week is obviously uh, NVIDIA. They will report earnings. And I think that could give us some clarity in the market. Are these huge expectations people have in the high-tech sector, yeah, the longest duration asset there is, uh, are they sustainable? Will we see the earnings growth the market expects now to come forward? Or will there disappointment? which is the question the alligator jars how they're closing will the energy sector pick up because we have a soft landing and everything is fantastic or will the information technology sector come down let's wait till next week uh, we are going to put on a nice little trade on the video i'm not telling you now what we're doing at the moment it will be uh, more neutral trade volatilities are at around a hundred percent on implied volatility rankings so that is screaming uh, for a transaction on the earnings side with limited risk, obviously. And the fear and greed index is still an extreme greed. Nick and I showed last week it was 78. So all the retailers in the market and the fund managers who have been underinvested are in the markets active. Yes, you're only extremely positive when you have already invested. The question is, when will the marginal buyer stop buying or when is the marginal buyer run out of cash this is usually when you find extreme greed when everybody is happy yes because everybody's invested and can only go upwards if you watched uh, uh, murad's monthly uh, we issued earlier this week uh, we are if you look at the relative rotation graph and momentum we are at a crucial point where it could go both ways again too early for positioning but you'll never hit the highs you never hit the lows uh, so let's wait for confirmation for me it's nvidia coming up next week uh, the numbers which could be uh, well, it's not even a canary in a coal mine. It's like the big fat turkey in the coal mine. Yeah? Let's see uh, how that is doing. Uh, inflation um, had conflicting signals. Yeah? We've, we've seen it. Oh, uh, CPI uh, core was higher than expected. People expected uh, uh, um, a reduction or lower numbers to come in. And then uh, consumer, uh, uh, consumer spending was down where people expected or oh, should be higher. So I'm more on the side of being cautious. I think inflation will not be a topic for the future because if you look at the energy chart at the, uh, uh, at the uh, electronics or uh, uh, information technology chart, uh, I'm more on the side that the alligator jaws will close eventually, but they will close from the top to the bottom, not the other way up. I might be wrong, but hey, that's why we have options to mitigate for these risks. So where I'm focusing my interest, and we had this fantastic chart last week already out there, Chinese stocks, yeah, object, heaviest objects in the universe. And I thought, hey, if NVIDIA is now worth as much as the entire Chinese stock market, and I'm not too much interested in the super short day, one day, zero days to expiration option trade, what could I do? So I was uh, China mixed picture it's about consumer confidence again. Uh, Chinese economy was living for decades of uh, uh, the, the Chinese consumer investing in real estate. At the peak, it was contributing up to 20% of the growth in Japan, just the real estate market. And with Evergrande officially being uh, uh, 
defaulted. Um, this has, well, a horrible scenario for the Chinese people out there because their private investments are mostly in real estate and properties they have there. So if this is not being solved, the solution, Chinese, the Chinese market might still have hard times ahead of it. However, Chinese, lar Chinese large cap, I have a chart here of the FXI, the ETF, which invests in Chinese large caps. And I thought, fine, where are we right now? We are where we have been in the financial crisis. Huh? So we have been in the financial crisis and the market trades at these levels. Now, uh, NVIDIA is worth more than all the Chinese companies in the world. Huh? all the Chinese companies. Uh, so why wouldn't I want to be invested in the FXI large cap? And I thought, let's run our analysis. And let me try to go to one of our magic tools we like to work with. Here we go. I'm sorry, you can't access that. You don't have a password. It's only for us what we are working for. And I went into our... Periodic return filter, it actually chases anomalies in the market. And I thought, oh, yeah, let's put that on a one year trading day direction and look at one standard deviation moves we have in the market. And what can I see here right at the top? It's not at the complete top anymore. We have now healthcare, which is also a sector which has underperformed. Corn, I don't have an opinion, don't know anything about corn, but we have the FXI. And China seems to be cheap at the moment. So what's this chart telling me? Look at this part. That's the mean return is producing over 252 days. Yeah? And we are now at minus 1.13 standard deviations. That does not mean it can go, cannot go lower. However, what it means is it's worth having, uh, uh, having a second look at it. And that's what we can see right here. Volatility-wise, we are at around mean levels on a 252-day level. And if we would assume just a return to the long-term mean, that leaves over the next year, trading year 41.44% only in statistical terms uh, for recovery in the Chinese large cap sector. What can you see here in this chart? It's a little bit for us options guys uh, where my colleague Tim who programmed this side simply said, okay, how did the market, if we've seen an anomaly like this, how did the market trade 10, 20, 30, 60 days afterwards? And these are the interesting charts. You can see here a scale and it simply tells me over 10 days, the market traded 50, in 56% of all historical observations above this level. Uh, the market traded in 81% of the time, higher than minus 5%. Yeah, So the market did not fall lower than 5% from this level over a period of 10 days and the same over uh, 10%. Yeah? So if I want to set up a trade, I would look in the 30 to 60 day region and say, fine. The market is bombed out in China. We have an anomaly here. How could I, could I get my, and I call it, you've heard it before on this show, wetting the beak. How do I get eased in a position to find out whether I'm right? Yeah, and the market will tell me if I'm right or whether I'm wrong. So I would start going around time period 30 to 60 day and try to sell some put options, which here, a put option with a strike price 5% below the current level in the past, but all historical observations did expire in 71% of the cases worthless. So you collect the premium, worst case scenario, you you collect the premium anyway, but the market tanks below 5% where we are at the moment. So you will have to buy 100 shares uh, if you trade one option contract for that, you get a premium and the option premiums at the moment for XLI make this actually quite attractive because the implied volatility ranking is very high. So have a look at that if you're so inclined. Nothing here is investment advice. That's obviously just an example of what I'm looking in at the moment. And it could be quite interesting. So let's go one step further. While we're talking about volatility, what can you see here in front of you? It's a spider and we have chased that into or, or, or split that into realized historic volatility. So that what really happened, yeah, how it did move and implied volatility, what you can see in the market. Pressure level here is at 19. 19 is for the VIX the medium long-term average. Yeah? So that is uh, uh, where we have most of the distribution over the long term since the VIX existed in here. What do these green and red bars tell me? This is simple 
the question if I put the pressure level on 20 you can see something here the realized volatility has now been below this pressure level for quite a long time if you see what happened in the past the average here was at 130 days then we've seen here uh, till 2022 uh, a peak of 267 days we are now at that peak again let's take it back again to exactly 19 we are still here and now let's look at the implied volatility what the market is trading and you can see here yes we have seen the longest stretch without anything happening going above this level of 147 days however at the moment we are around 70 75 days and you can see here in the past that usually seems to be something where markets start to readjust of course i can also put the moving average in which is simply calculating uh, uh, the 30 day moving average of the implied volatility in this example and what you can see here again uh, we seem to be at the 200 days just now taking the uh, moving average into consideration that we are below the long-term moving average in here. Uh, when that happened in the past, that's usually when our internal systems, our traffic light system turn from green. Yeah, We, know we want low volatility. We've seen that volatility was extremely low. Market made nice performance. Volatility seems to go now into a crucial phase. We are still low at the moment. However, that didn't last forever. And you know Herb's law, things that can't last forever will eventually stop. And low volatility also seems to be one of those. And then especially taking into consideration, obviously, um, seasonalities from mid-February on the whole through March were never a really good way to, well, be completely exposed to the markets. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of bad things happening in my career. It's from the 2000s to uh, 2008 when Bear Stearns folded to the Corona crisis. Somehow these March events seem to take down, drag down the averages. And we had so far a very good performance in February. So this is my personal little, well, gray market monologue with just a few slides obviously you have seen i had to retort to the statistics to the math stuff which we like to have a look into things next week for the deeper analysis i hope nick will be well again uh, to get him on board i hope you have enjoyed this little short uh, uh, episode uh, and um, i shall pass on if you wish so your best wishes to nick that he gets better soon have a lovely successful week Look at the NVIDIA figures, look at Chinese large, large caps and think the energy sector, it can go both ways. Yeah? Depends on where we are in the cycle. Are we going to see a recession? Are we not? These words. Thank you very much and bye-bye.